OK, let's talk about these questions. Number one, uh, is it always just for truth to win out in a contest of force? 6114. So page 18. And Abdul here is saying. Well, let's take a look. Oh, heaven, that such resemblance of the highest should yet remain. Uh, the highest is God, right? And resemblance of the highest is saying Satan looks so similar to God. In other words, he's so powerful. He's so close to God. Should yet remain. Uh, he wants to become God and yet he and he's still here where faith and realty remain not. He's here, but his faith and his sincerity are here no more. Wherefore, which means why? Wherefore should not strength and might there fail where virtue fails? So since Satan's virtue has failed, should not his strength and might also fail? Or weakest prove where boldest? Since he doesn't have virtue, shouldn't it be true that the bolder he is, the weaker he is? Though to sight unconquerable, even though it looks like he cannot be beaten. His puissance or his power, trusting in the Almighty's aid, I mean to try. So puissance is actually the object of this sentence. Trusting in God's help, I will try his power. Try here means test. Whose reason I have tried. Uh, whose is of course Satan's, right? His puissance. Whose so it's his reason I have tried unsound and false. I have tested his reason and I have found it to be unsound, which means uh, illogical and false. So I know that he's wrong. Now I'm going to try whether his power is also weak, as weak as his logic and his virtue. Nor is it ought but just. Ought means anything. So it must be just that he who in debate of truth hath won should win in arms in both disputes alike victor. So it's it is only just if someone who wins a debate of virtue should also win in a fight. Arms means weapons. In both disputes are like victor, so he should win in both kinds of fight, a logical fight and a, a military fight. Though brutish that contest and foul, so even though fighting is a brutish and foul thing, brutish means like an animal. Foul means dirty. So even though fighting is brutish and foul, when reason has to deal with force, yet so most reason is that reason overcome. So when someone who is right does have to fight to prove it, it is only when reason wins the fight that it is most reasonable. Uh, I guess in Chinese this is something like uh, something like that. So back to the original question. Does this make sense? Two groups took this question. And they disagreed. One group says it is not always that the truth will win in a fight. Sometimes the winner of the fight will be the wrong side, simply because power and truth are two different things. The other group says that this might be true, or this might be correct, but 
when truth does win in a fight, only then can it be called just. Uh, and so when Abdil is saying something like, uh, I have already won the debate, now I just need to win the fight to prove it. It's not a logical connection, it's a it's a motivational connection. He's trying to motivate himself. He's gearing up for the battle. He's trying to raise his morale. It's a Vincent Uh He believes that only this kind of outcome would be just, and therefore it is his job to realize that just outcome. Though if we do think about the, the idea that the winner should be correct, uh, in our fallen human world, another way to understand this is that history is written by the victors. So when we read about history, of course it looks like the right guys always won the wars because they're the ones who wrote the history. Uh, but of course, this story is not about human history. It's about celestial heavenly history. Uh, and we know that God is always correct. Question two, their first experience of pain. So let's look at this. 320 to 53. Okay, so Abdiel says, I'm going to fight Satan. Uh, and so... You can imagine, right? The two armies are standing facing each other, and then Abdiel comes forward, and then Satan comes forward, and they fight angel to angel, man to man. Um, 316. Together, both with next to almighty arm, next to means almost. So their weapons are almost as powerful as God's weapons. Uplifted, imminent, one stroke they aimed that might determine. So they both raised their swords, preparing. Imminent means about to happen. So they're preparing to try to win the fight with one stroke. Uh, determine means end, to end the fight, to decide the fight. And not need repeat as not of power at once. Uh, and as not of power, the footnote says, because they would not have power to repeat the blow. So the idea is they want to win the fight by striking once, and they put all of their energy and power into this one strike. Nor odds appeared in might or swift prevention. So they both seemed equal in strength and in the speed of their actions. Prevention, it says, is anticipation. So their minds and their bodies are moving equally fast. But the sword of Michael from the armory of God. Sorry, did I say it's Abdiel? Uh, I think Abdiel lost. My bad. This is, the, this is another angel. Michael. Uh, of my, the sword of Michael from the armory of God was given him tempered so that neither keen nor solid might resist that edge. So Michael's sword came from God's armory, Dringhoku, a place where you keep weapons, and it was tempered. Okay, the word temper is related to temperature, right? This is talking about how the sword is made. Do you guys know how to make a sword? You take a, a, a long piece of iron, heat it, and when it's hot enough, you can hit it to change its shape. Uh, and you can use other tools. You can, uh, and like if you take this metal and you heat it and you cool it and you heat it and you cool it, it becomes harder. Uh, and then at, finally, at the end, you you wipe away all of the uh, imperfections and you have a sword. And that process is called tempering. So this sword was tempered in such a way 
that neither sharp or blunt could resist its edge. Keen means sharp. Solid here means something fixed, or so we can think of it as like a blunt object. Uh, so it, the idea is this sword is so powerful, nothing can stop this sword. It met the sword of Satan with steep force to smite descending. So this sword is descending from above, right? You can imagine Michael is like swinging the sword and Satan is blocking the sword. Uh, smite means to, to cut or to attack. And in half cut sheer nor stayed. So it cut Satan's sword in half. Cleanly, sheer means cleanly. And it didn't even stop. Like Satan's sword not only broke, but it didn't even stop Michael's sword. But with swift wheel reverse. Uh, so after swinging down, Michael turns and swings back up. Deep entering shared all his right side, and when he swings back up, it cuts into Satan's right side. Then Satan first knew pain and writhed him to and fro convolved. So he's in pain, he's on the floor, uh, squirming about, writhing about in pain. So sore the grinding sword with discontinuous wound passed through him. That's how painful the wound created by this sword was as it passed through Satan. But the ethereal substance closed not long divisible. Satan's body is not a mortal body, it's a heavenly body, so it's called ethereal substance. Ethereal means heavenly. Substance means material. So Satan's body closed up quickly, not long divisible. It, it cannot be kept open for long. And from the gash or from the, the opening of the wound, a stream of nectarous humor issuing flowed sanguine. Uh, so uh, again, it's a heavenly body. So it, instead of blood, there is nectar. Uh, in Chinese, we call this uh, hua mi, or I guess here would be sen mi. Uh, humor just means a bodily fluid, sen ti de yi ti. Issuing means coming out. Flowed sanguine like blood or blood red. So Satan feels pain. And then this is kind of funny. Forthwith, so immediately on all, I'm uh, line 335. Forthwith on all sides to his aid was run by angels many and strong who interposed defense while others bore him on their shields back to his chariot where it stood retired from off the files of war. So what's happening? Some angels run up to Satan. Some stand in front protecting him and the other angels put Satan on their shields and carry him back. Remember, Satan suffered one cut and, and he he can't even die. And yet like all of his angels are like, oh my God, or I guess not God, but like, oh my Satan, and they carry him back to camp. Uh, which to me just seems ridiculous. So after this scene, does this change your understanding of the rebellion? One group, or I guess two groups, uh, took this question. One group said yes, because, you know, they're saying like we're as powerful as God, we should be in control of heaven. But look at what happens the first time they are attacked. They're, they're, they're uh, like turning, tossing and turning around on the ground in pain, and then Satan is quickly carried back to camp. Ridiculous. Are these really rebels or are these little kids? The other group said it did, it did not change their view of the rebellion because the rebellion was stupid to begin with. God is almighty, all powerful, omnipotent, all knowing. There's no way the rebellion could succeed. So yes, 
this scene makes the rebel angels look even more stupid. But according to this group, they were already stupid to begin with, so it does not change our understanding of what's going on. Yeah, I just think it's really interesting, right? They they talk a big talk about winning this war and they don't even know what war is. Question three, nobody took this question. Uh, so let's take a look at this. This question is about using jokes and puns. 558. Yeah, OK, page 21. Um, so. The um, rebelling angels are losing and Satan says, OK, prepare the cannon. Now, you might be thinking, why aren't they already using cannons? It's a war. And the answer is Satan invents cannons. He is the first guy to use cannons in war. Which I think is also kind of funny. Uh, so let's take a look at this 558 Vanguard, which is the very front line. To right and left, the front unfold, so open up the front. That all may see who hate us, everyone who hates us can see. How we seek peace and composure. Uh, composure here means agreement. And with open breasts, uh, today we would say open arms, stand ready to receive them if they like our overture. So it looks like he's saying, uh, front line, stand aside, show the other side that we're willing to look for peace if they are also willing to look for peace. But what he's really saying is, stand aside, so that they can receive our cannons, our cannon fire. Overture is an initial action seeking peace. But here Satan is saying our initial cannon attack. And so instead of receiving like a negotiation party, the other side will be receiving cannon fire. Uh, 562 and turn not back perverse, so don't turn around. But that I doubt, however, witness heaven, heaven witness thou anon, while we discharge freely our part. So as heaven is our witness, uh, don't doubt us, for soon you will see, heaven witness thou anon, you heaven will see, soon, anon means soon, while we discharge freely our part. On the surface, he's saying, don't turn away, listen as we talk and say what we want to say. But really he's saying, don't run away while we fire our cannons at you. Uh, discharge means to let out, whether it's let out words or let out cannon fire. Part can mean our prepared speech or, or, or our stance, or it could mean our cannon fire, the thing that we're shooting. Ye who appointed stand do as you have in charge and briefly touch what we propound and loud that all may hear. So you guys on the other side, stand there. Uh, I charge you, you know, uh, and at least listen to what we offer and do so loudly, uh, like negotiate loudly so that everyone can hear. Sorry, sorry, propound is we. So we are propounding loudly so that everyone may hear. It looks like he, Satan is saying the other side, don't go, we just want to talk. But what he's really saying is uh, in charge can also mean the fire you use to fight to light the cannon. There's a deer and a hole. Propound can mean propose, and in this case, pound means hit. And therefore, loud is not talking about their words, it's talking about their cannons. So this entire stanza is one long pun, and it's very sarcastic. 
it looks like Satan is saying, open up so that we can seek peace. Don't run away. Listen to what we have to say. But really he's saying, stand aside so we can fire our cannons and don't run away. Let us hit you. Uh, next stanza, there's a quotation mark because this whole story is being told by Michael to Adam. It's a flashback. So it says that Satan is scoffing in ambiguous words. Scoffing means mocking, laughing. Uh, and then it says uh, they start firing cannons. Uh, let's skip this part. Because uh, after, th like the cannons are terrible. Remember, this is the first war in heavenly history. So neither side is prepared for war. Satan gets cut. God's angels get fired on. Nobody knows what's going on. Uh, and so it does a lot of damage. Uh, I think there's even more sarcasm later. Let me find it. Yes, so page 23. After God's angels started running, 609, uh, Satan again starts mocking them. Oh, friends, why come not on these victors proud? Uh, so why don't you accept your victory, right? We're trying to we're trying to negotiate for peace. Why don't you accept that you have won? Erewhile, which means mean uh, before, they fierce were coming. They were attacking us very fiercely. And when we to entertain them fair with open front and breast, so when it looks like we welcomed, entertain here means welcome, welcome them fairly by opening up our front lines and opening up our arms to embrace them. But what it really means is when we receive them, when we counterattacked by opening up our front lines and firing on them, what could we more propounded terms of composition? Again, on the surface, it sounds like we tried to talk about a peace treaty, but really he's saying we fired stuff at you. Straight, they changed their minds, flew off, and into strange vagaries fell. Uh, here, it mean, uh, the explanation is eccentric motions. So we can say he's saying, uh, but then you guys started running around for no reason. Obviously, the reason is because of the cannon fire. Uh, as they would dance, it looks like they're dancing, yet for a dance they seem somewhat extravagant and wild. But it's a very crazy kind of dance. Perhaps for joy of offering peace. Maybe they're dancing like this because they're so happy that they're going to win. Uh, of course, the real reason is because they're being fired on and they're running around to avoid the cannon fire. But I suppose if our proposals once again were heard, we should compel them to a quick result. Again, on the surface, if we repeated uh, that we want peace, maybe we can end the war faster. In reality, maybe if we fired on them again, we could win faster. We can force them uh, to surrender faster. And then another uh, rebellious angel, Belial, also uses a lot of puns to answer Satan. I think we get the idea. So back to this question. What does this say about the Christian view of sarcastic humor and puns? So first of all, it's only Satan's side that uses language in this way. And they use it in this way when they are winning. So it looks like the poem is putting puns and sarcasm and wordplay in a negative light. It's portraying these games as bad or evil, connected with Satan. And we can remember, uh, at the, if, you, if you've ever read the Bible in the very beginning, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God. And so the, the Bible, which is a written document, is holy. Uh, it is said to be 
written by people who were divinely inspired by God. Uh, and even when translating, the translators are said to be divinely guided. So in the Christian worldview, God's use of language is very serious. Uh, God issues commands. We have the Ten Commandments. Words are important. It's important to obey God's words. So when Satan and his army are making jokes and making puns, they're giving one word two meanings. They're corrupting the language. And in this case, it's not human language. It's God, it's heavenly language. Like we know about the story of the Tower of Babel, right? Uh, humans build a tower very high because they want to try to reach God. And God says, uh, that's not a good idea. We should stop them. And so God uh, makes it so that people cannot understand each other. And that is the beginning of different human languages. But this is not human. This is in heaven. There is only one language in heaven. It is the heavenly language. And yet Satan's army is corrupting that language. It's giving one language two meanings. So yes, it's kind of funny, but for readers uh, in that period of history who really valued the Christian religion and Christian worldview, it was funny in a very dark kind of way, very dark humor. Question four, the debate between Adam and Eve. Okay, let's take a look at this. Right, so page 24. This is Eve. Um, so um, at, at this point, they have received some messages from God through various angels. Uh, one of these messages is uh, you should help take care of the Garden of Eden. Like, you know, to control the plants, make order out of chaos. And the other message is be careful about Satan. He's going to try to do something. OK, Eve says, Adam, well, may we labor still to dress this garden. Yes, we should continuously continually work to um, organize this garden, still to tend plant, herb and flower. Tend means take care of. Our pleasant task enjoined. We have been ordered to do this pleasant job. But till more hands aid us, the work under our labor grows, luxurious by restraint. Until we have more hands to help us, so until we have more people, our work will only grow. Our workload will only grow because these plants keep growing, basically. The idea is the garden is so big, we're only two people, we'll never finish. What we by day lop overgrown, lop means cut off, or prune, which means to cut in order to organize, or prop, which means to make it stand up, or bind, which means tie together. So we do all of this in the day, but one night or two with wanton growth derides, tending to wild. So we do all of this in the day, but after one or two nights, it, it, the garden will return to its original chaos. Thou therefore now advise or hear what to my mind first thoughts present. So therefore, listen to my idea. Let us divide our labors. Thou her choice leads thee or her most needs, whether to wind the boat. So you do what you think should be done. And I will do what I think should be done. And what she thinks should be done is line 217. While I in yonder spring of roses intermixed with myrtle, find what to redress till noon. So she's saying you can go take care of those plants. 
I'm going to go play with flowers. Uh, and then she gives her reason, 220. For a while so near each other thus all day, our task we choose, what wonder if so near looks intervene and smiles or object new, uh, sorry, object new casual discourse draw on. So we're so close to each other all day. It would be no wonder if we keep looking at each other and smiling at each other, or if we start chatting and that this interrupts our day's work so that we finish only a little bit of work every day. Even if we begin early, though begun early, and the hour of supper comes unearned, and therefore when we have dinner, we will not have worked enough to deserve to eat dinner. This is a very uh, Protestant way of thinking about this. Uh, Calvinism says like the harder you work, the stronger the signal that you are one of God's chosen ones. So uh, a lot of Protestant churches really value hard work. Uh, and so it, it, Eve is saying, if we don't work hard enough, we don't deserve to have dinner. Uh, did I mention that Milton is a Protestant? So like in this poem, it's not just about biblical history. It's also about theology. Uh, and then Adam gives an answer. Uh, he begins by praising Eve. But then he gives his actual response, line 235. Yet, which means but, right? Well, you're, you're such a great woman, you're so smart, but not so strictly hath our Lord imposed labor as to debar us when we need refreshment. So yes, God asked us to do this work, but he's not so strict as to prevent us when we need rest, whether food or talk between food of the mind. So that rest could be in, in the form of food, in the form of conversation, which he calls food of the mind, or this sweet intercourse of looks and smiles, or even if we just exchange looks, exchange smiles. And he's saying, Smiles from reason flow to brute denied. So animals cannot smile because animals don't have reason, Li Xing, and are of love the food, love not the lowest end of human life. Smiling is the food of love, and love is pretty important for human life. For not to irksome toil, but to delight he made us. Irksome toil is annoying work. So God created us not to work, uh, do this annoying work, but to enjoy life. And delight to reason joined, and it is reasonable to enjoy life. Uh, and then Adam is saying, don't worry about the work. When we have children later, we will naturally be able to do more work in the future. And then line 251, Adam gives his counter argument. So this previous section is a response, it's a rebuttal. Here he gives his own argument why they should stick together. But other doubt possesses me, something else that I'm worried about. Lest harm befall thee severed from me. Lest means for fear that. I don't want this to happen. I don't want you to be hurt. To befall someone means to happen to someone. Severed means separated. So I'm worried. I don't want you to be hurt while you are away from me. For because thou knowst what hath been warned us. You remember the warning. What malicious foe, what evil enemy. Envying our happiness and of his own despairing seeks to work us woe and shame by sly assaults. This Satan guy, he is jealous of us. He himself 
does not have happiness. So he will try and make us suffer and shameful, and he will do this using some secret trick. Sly means secretly. Assault means attack. And somewhere nigh at hand watches, no doubt. No doubt he is somewhere near. Nigh means near. He's watching us. With greedy hope to find his wish and best advantage, us asunder. He's just waiting for us to separate so that he can have a bigger advantage. Because he's hopeless to circumvent us joined. When we are together, he has no hope to beat us. Circumvent means to go around. Here it means to defeat us. Uh, because when we're together, where each to other speedy aid might lend at need. So if we're together, we can quickly help each other. And then he's saying no matter what his plan is, his plan may be to turn us against God. Maybe his plan is to turn us against each other. Um, but the safest thing to do is to stay by my side. Safest and here, this is line 268. Safest and seemliest, which means most proper, by her husband stays, who guards her, or with her the worst endures. It's best to stay by your husband. Your husband will protect you. If he can't protect you, at least you will suffer together. And then Eve gives her response, again, starting by praising Adam. Oh, you're a great guy, whatever. But, again, that but, line 279. But that thou shouldst my firmness therefore doubt to God or thee, because we have a phone may tempt it, I expected not to hear. The subject is I. I did not expect to hear you doubt my firmness of mind, my determination in relation to God or to you, simply because we have an enemy who might try to tempt us. So basically she's saying, how can you doubt me? I'm your wife. Uh, and then his violence thou fearest not being such as we not capable of death or pain can either not receive or can repel. So she's responding to Adam's ideas. What if Satan tries this? What if Satan tries that? And she's saying, no, this won't work. That won't work. And she gives reasons. Therefore, we don't have to be afraid of Satan. And then Adam gives his reply, uh, again, praising Eve. And then he says, not, uh, this is line 293, not diffident of thee do I dissuade thy absence from my sight. I'm not trying to keep you here because I don't believe in you. But to avoid the tempt itself intended by our foe. I'm trying to keep you here so that Satan doesn't try something. Like if we're separated, he might think he has an opportunity. And even if he doesn't actually have a chance, he might try anyway. And his idea is that if Satan tries something, it would be dishonoring us because we gave him the chance. Uh, even if he fails. And on the next page. Uh, and so he's saying, therefore, we should always stick together and don't give Satan the chance. Next page, line 322. Eve replies, if this be our condition, remember, notice she did not say, oh, Adam, you're such a great guy. She jumps directly into the debate. If this be our condition, if it is true, thus to dwell in narrow circuit straightened by a foe, subtle or violent. If we can only live in fear of Satan, if we have to always be careful. Uh, we not endued single with like defense wherever met. How are we happy still in fear of harm? How can we always be happy if we are always afraid? And then she responds to Adam saying, if Satan tries something, it is not our dishonor. It is his dishonor. It's not our fault if Satan tries something. Uh, 
And then Adam says, uh, again, oh, uh, you are such a great woman. Next page. Um, he says, God did give us free will, but he also gave us this warning, and we should probably listen to the warning. But, 370. But, if thou think trial unsought may find us both secure, then thus warn thou seemst go. If you really think that it would be better to face Satan separately, even though you have been warned, fine, you can go. For thy stay not free absence thee more. If you're staying only because I force you, it's like you have already left. So if you really want to go, go. And that is the end of the debate. You will notice that Adam still thinks that Eve is wrong, but he lets Eve go anyway. Um, and the key point, as two groups who chose this question noticed, the key point is free. If you're staying here because you are not free to go, then it's like you're not here at all. So it does seem like the poem is saying the most important value is not rational debate. Eve loses the debate. But Adam lets her go anyway, because to Adam, free will is more important than being right. Uh, and in fact, this is the same thing that God says. Last week we saw God say, I know humans will make this mistake. I can see it. But I gave them free will, and that is more important because if I force them to listen to me, there is no value in that. They have to choose to listen to me. So Adam is doing the same thing that God has done. Uh, and then the last question, the serpent's argument about the forbidden fruit. So. Eve is walking around by herself. And suddenly she sees this serpent praising the forbidden tree. The serpent is talking and Eve goes over and says, hey, you're a snake. How are you talking? And then uh, Satan says, oh, I ate this fruit and it let me talk and it maybe it can help you too. And Eve is like, OK, what fruit are you talking about? And Satan says, uh, follow me. I will bring you there. Page 29, the way is ready and not long. So I know where it is. Follow me. Line 630, I can bring thee thither soon. Thither means there. And Eve says, OK, let's go. And they go and they see the tree. And Eve says, oh, no, 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 no. Wait, that's the tree God says we can't eat because we will die. Um, and this is what she's saying, right? Of the fruit of each tree in the garden we may eat, but of the fruit of this fair tree amidst the garden, God had said, you shall not eat thereof, nor shall you touch it, lest ye die. Uh, and then Satan on page 30, uh, and the poem says, like, Satan's speech is more persuasive than any speech in ancient history. And Satan says, uh, line 679, first he says, oh, sacred, wise, and wisdom-giving plant. So remember, in the debate between Adam and Eve, they praise each other. But here Satan is praising a tree. And then he, he gives some reasons why it is good to eat. 685. Those rigid threats of death do not believe. Ye shall not die. How should ye? By the fruit? It gives you life to knowledge. By the threatener? So if you eat it, will God really kill you? Look on me. Me, who have touched and tasted, yet both live and life more perfect have attained than fate meant me by venturing higher than my lot. So he's saying, look at me, I ate the fruit, I'm still alive, my life in fact has gotten better. 
much better than uh, I would have been allowed as a simple snake. My lot means my destiny. Shall that be shut to man which to the beast is open? If I, a snake, can eat it, why can't humans? Or will God really kill you just because of this little thing? And then Satan goes on to say, uh, is this rule really a good rule? Of good, how just? Of evil, what is evil be real? If what is evil be real, why not known since easier shunned? It, the fruit is knowledge of good and evil. So why does God not let you have this knowledge? And then he says, it's because God is afraid that if you gain this knowledge, you will be as powerful as he is. Opened and cleared, and ye shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil as they know. Uh, and so Satan is saying, first of all, I did it. Nothing happened to me. And he, then he's saying the rule doesn't make sense. And then he's saying God only gave you this rule because he's afraid of you. And what are this is the next page 31 and what are gods that man may not become as they? Why can't humans become gods themselves? And then after his speech, Eve. He ended and his words replete with guile into her heart too easy entrance one because his words were so sneaky, they entered into Eve's heart. And so she looks at the fruit and then look what happens next. She says, great are thy virtues, doubtless best of fruits. Now Eve starts to praise the fruit. This is like idolatry. Right? This is not worshiping God. This is worshiping a tree and worshiping a fruit. And then on the next page. Uh, Reaching to the fruit she plucked, she ate. So yes, she was successfully seduced. And uh, next week we'll begin reading from here. To go back to the question, what could is this convincing? And uh, is there a specific point? Two groups took this question and they both think that the specific point that is most convincing is when Satan says, I ate the fruit, look at me, I'm fine. In fact, I, I can now talk. Uh, and both groups believe that the personal example is the most convincing part of Satan's argument. It's also the most dangerous part of his argument. When he's saying, does this rule make sense? Why would God do this? You can argue with him. But when he says, I did it, look at me, you can't really argue with that. The logic is perfect. But Satan is lying because he did not actually eat the fruit. So sometimes just looking at the logic of an argument is not enough. You have to look at the entire situation. Is there some knowledge that you don't have? Is there some information that you don't know? OK, uh, questions? Right, next week finish the selections of the poem. And then I will introduce the midterm exam. The exam will be a one week take home online exam. OK, see you next week.